Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to the 2013 U.S. Bicycling Hall of Fame induction evening. Thank you very much for being here. I am your MC for the evening, Bruce Hildenbrand. Some of you know me. For those of you who don't know me, I've been covering the sport of bike racing as a journalist for over 35 years. Covered my first international race in 1980. Been to the Tour de France, the Vuelta España, the Giro d'Italia, and many, many races, the World Championships, of course. Paris-Roubaix, got all my stuff stolen out of the vehicle at Paris-Roubaix. That was always fun. But anyways, just recently at the Tour Azerbaijan. Anybody know where Tour Azerbaijan is? Anybody know where Azerbaijan is? So a great international race to go to. So I'm your MC for the evening. I want to thank you all. Of course, we want to recognize our future inductees tonight. We have a class of four very deserving cyclists and cycling personalities that will be inducting. But how about the people that are here that have already been inducted? Wayne Stetna, Wayne, why don't you raise your hand? George Mount, where's smiling George Mount? Bob Parsons, Bob? Ted Ernst, where's Ted? Ted, raise your hand. Toby Henderson, Bernie Anderson, and Jackie Phelan. So thank you to our inductees. So again, this is a very special evening because the sport of cycling, of course, is near and dear to every one of our hearts. Those of us who have raced for many years, been spectators, been journalists, been race promoters, the whole sport, whether it's mountain biking, BMX, road biking, track cycling, we're, we are going to inter introduce and induct a number of riders across the full spectrum of cycling. And it's going to be a great evening, so I think you're going to enjoy yourselves. We brought some videos here. We also have our, the inductees to come up and give you their thoughts about their careers. And so we do have our silent auction going on. It will close after our intermission. We will have a live auction. So if you've got an item out there you're kind of thinking about, you haven't really decided you want it, we still have some time during the intermission for you to go out there and take uh, a look at that item and maybe bid on it. So again, thank you very much for coming. At this time, I'd like to welcome to the stage the Honorable Mayor of Davis, Joe Kravotza. Joe. Thank you all so much. Uh, delighted to be here again. I think this is the, this is the sixth induction ceremony that Davis has uh, been able to, uh, to host. Uh, the mayor honors this occasion with a, with a tux, uh, of course. Uh, though I do feel, um, you know, just a little bit uh, 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 naked, if you will, up here. I was so excited uh, about a year ago uh, for this dinner that I bought a matching bike bow tie with a bike handkerchief. And then I went on a, a, a fundraiser for our local media access TV, uh, and they promptly uh, began an auction of my bike bow tie and my bike uh, necklace uh, without telling me, and it sold for $300. So when you're the mayor of Davis, uh, I guess your bike bow tie becomes worth something. So I did want to, um, I just did want to say that we're just honored to have the, the hall here. There's no question about that. Uh, the city is delighted to uh, support the hall through our building, uh, through all the work that we do to integrate the hall into really the fabric of Davis. Uh, we're always looking for ways at the city to support the hall, and we look forward to that, uh, to that continuing. Uh, my colleagues and I on the city council, uh, and I've got, we've got Lucas Frerichs here tonight for sure. Lucas, uh, welcome. Very good. Any other members of the council here? Make sure I'm... Uh, politically uh, okay, uh, but I do want to say uh, just a couple of uh, a couple of things. Um, the um, you know you know the basics about the city of Davis. In 2005, we were named the first uh, platinum level uh, bicycle friendly city in America by the League of American Bicyclists. Uh, we we thought that that was good enough, but then they created a category above platinum called diamond. Uh, and now we have to aspire to diamond, therefore our new bike plan is called Beyond Platinum. So here we go. Uh, everybody in this room should be getting excited about 2017. Uh, 2017 will first of all be the 50th anniversary of the first bike lanes in America that of course uh, were created in Davis, California. 
right? And then it's also the 200th anniversary of the invention of the bicycle in 1817, at least that's the date we're using, and it's the 100th anniversary of the city of Davis in uh, 2017. So some, uh, someone said, you know, that's coincidence. That's not coincidence. It's destiny. It's providence. You're in the right place. Davis is in the right place. So thank you. So you know the, the you know uh, the the facts. Eleven square miles, a hundred miles of combined uh, bike uh, bike paths. Uh, we have a twenty percent mode share here in Davis, California, on bikes. The next closest city is uh, Boulder at nine point nine percent mode share. Uh, that's a cry for help, uh, but we're going to do all we can to help Boulder out uh, to to get where they need to be. Uh, in our new bike plan, we're going to aspire to a thirty percent mode share. Now uh, I want to give a little shout out to UC Davis as well. On Thursday, UC Davis uh, received status of being a platinum level bicycle university or bike friendly university. That adds to UC Davis being a platinum level, level bicycle friendly business. So UC Davis, you're double platinum, fantastic. Uh, add that to the city of Davis and we're all now triple platinum, so very good. Young people don't know what double platinum and triple platinum means, we do. Um, uh, but I want to kind of just reflect very, very briefly um, that we here uh, are not just part of a city movement or a state movement. We're all part of a, of a national movement. We're all part of this expanding bike culture uh, that we're seeing uh, literally race across the United States of America. We're seeing uh, bike share, you know, thriving in uh, Washington, D.C., in San Francisco, uh, in New York. You're seeing cities like New York uh, doing what every city does, which is say, how can we be more like Davis, California, right? So, um, but, but, but how does that happen? I mean, it happens because we've got this fantastic constellation of, of road racers and manufacturers and recreational riders and BMXers. Uh, we've got advocates, uh, trade associations. Uh, we've got... Um, We've got, you know, we've got the bike share coming along. We've got safe routes to schools programs going uh, national. Uh, we've got Bikes Belong. We've got the League of American Bicyclists in Davis. We've got the Hall of Fame. We have our bike co-op. We, uh, we have our local bike group, Davis Bicycles. All of this comes together. And one of the things I wanted to, uh, to observe is that we started a little campaign uh, in Davis this year uh, with these stickers, and everybody's got one at their place. And it says, start seeing bikes uh, everywhere, Davis, California. And as we think about expanding the bike culture in America, I want us to think about seeing bikes everywhere. And at first I thought this was just about safety. So you say, uh, in the name of safety, start seeing bikes everywhere, okay? But let's say, uh, to get kids to school uh, with parents not having to drive, start seeing bikes uh, everywhere, right? To promote uh, health and recreation, start seeing bikes everywhere, all right? To promote more social interaction, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be louder, it's going to be more succinct, and so on. To, uh, you got to get your congressman, uh, like we've gotten ours, John Garamendi and formerly Mike Thompson, to join the Congressional Bike Caucus so that they start all right, to reduce uh, congestion for those who drive. All right, to lower greenhouse gas emissions so that we stabilize the uh, atmosphere of the planet. All right, to help cities save money on infrastructure. Okay, to build livable communities. All right, and tell your elected officials, state, local, and federal, too. All right, very good. Welcome, everybody. Congratulations to the inductees, and I'm looking forward to a wonderful evening with all of you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. How many Aggies are out there in the crowd? Who went to UC Davis? I'm raising my hand. How many Aggies out there? All right. Great to have you all here. Too bad Freeborn Hall looks like they're going to seismically retrofit it or something. Yeah, they don't know what they're going to do about it. But at this time, I'd like to welcome to the podium the head of the Board of Directors of the U.S. Bicycling Hall of Fame, Mr. Anthony Costello. Start seeing bikes everywhere. It's always hor it's horrible to follow Joe Cravosa. Everyone in town knows that. You, you want to go before Joe, not after Joe, so I'm, 
I'm in the unfortunate position of having to follow him, but I'm gonna do my best here. So um, thanks for the introduction, Bruce. Um, I'm Anthony Costello, I'm the president of the board of directors for the hall. Uh, on behalf of the board, many, many of who are here tonight, uh, I'd like to thank you for being here. Um, this is our 27th induction ceremony, sixth here in, in town, but the 27th uh, Hall of Fame induction ceremony uh, since the hall was founded in the 80s. Um, we, we always have three main goals for this event, and I just wanna touch briefly on those. Uh, first and foremost, these lead tables here in front are full of our special inductees for this year. Uh, it's a special night for them. Doris, Beth, Mike, and Vince. Um, always very difficult to summarize the kind of careers these people have, have, have had in just one short evening. Uh, but we hope that you all leave here tonight feeling as though you've been recognized for the truly amazing accomplishments of your career. So let's give them a, a round of applause, please. <clears throat> Our second goal for this event is always that it's entertaining for you. Um, we expect that tonight you'll be reminded about a lot of things you already knew about these athletes and, and contributors in their careers. We also expect that you'll learn a lot of new things that you probably didn't know. We try to focus on videos and speeches and stories so that the audience can really feel like they got to know the inductees and hopefully you get to know a little bit more about what we're doing at the Hall of Fame in the process. Um, in the audience tonight, we're joined by many friends and family members of the inductees, also by members of the board of directors and many strong supporters of the Hall of Fame. From Davis, from the Sacramento region, California in general, and, and uh, many that have traveled across states to be here as well. In particular, I, I'd like to thank Mayor Joe Cravosa again for his comments uh, and the context that he's able to give for the Hall of Fame fitting into uh, Davis's bike culture in general. Um, and I'd like to give him one more round of applause as well. Thank you. <laughs> Campaign contributions no, at the table 11. Uh, I'd, I'd also like to recognize our events and facilities manager, um, Sabrina Vigil. I don't even know if she's in here at this point, but. <laughs> Sabrina and, and her cast of um, co-opted volunteers f sort of fly under the radar, but trust me, uh, this event wouldn't, wouldn't be happening tonight without Sabrina's hard work, and um, I think we tend to forget the people that are pulling this event together. So I just want to make sure that we recognize you, Sabrina. Thanks for all your help. Um, <clears throat> we're also fortunate to have some key board members from the Hall of Fame board and uh, city and county leadership here tonight. So I want to recognize and maybe folks can raise their hands from our board of directors at the Hall of Fame. Wayne Stetna is here. Uh, Rusty Schomer. Where's Rusty? John Hess. Brody Hamilton. <laughs> Bob Bowen is here, of course. We have DK. Matt Dulcich. There's Matt. And George Mount is here as well. I'd also like to recognize David Takamoto Wirtz for a moment. He's not officially on the board, but as anyone who's had a tour at the Hall of Fame knows, David is the master of all things U.S. Bicycling Hall of Fame, and nobody does a tour like David. So if you need one, you, you better book him soon. <clears throat> uh, they've already been mentioned, but I'm gonna mention just one more time. I think Rochelle Swanson may be running a little late, but our city council members here already are, are Joe, who you met. Lucas Frerix is here. Rochelle's on her way. Um, these board members for the Hall of Fame and these government leaders have formed a very strong partnership the last few years to support the Hall of Fame's success here in Davis. Uh, besides being individual supporters themselves, they also advocate for the Hall in many ways through government channels, public relations, um, evangelizing around the state and even at national levels. The, the Hall of Fame truly would not be in Davis without the vision of these leaders and the board and the financial support that we receive from them every year. So thanks again for all of that support. So speaking of financial support, I'm gonna close out here with the third important goal we always have for this induction ceremony, and, and that is to make this a successful fundraiser for the Hall of Fame. Um, 
Like many nonprofits, the Hall of Fame relies on membership sales, small individual donations, and a couple of key fundraising events like this one each year. Uh, tonight, we've got a lot of great auction items, and, and we're going to be encouraging. I think Bruce will be encouraging you frequently tonight to bid um, often and, and, and liberally. Uh, our event sponsors are also critical to making this event possible. I think we have a slide up for them, but uh, I'd like to just take a moment to name them. These individuals and groups have come forward to financially support this event and also to make donations to this event without which we, we probably would not be able to afford to host this dinner every, every year. So I'd like to mention them. Uh, Corona Track is our key sponsor. We also are sponsored by UC Davis, the Cliff Family Winery, New Belgium Brewing Company, Davis Media Access, who's responsible for all the video production you see tonight, the printer, the Davis Hallmark Inn, who makes generous contributions every year to help house the inductees that come into town and their friends and family, uh, Strelitzia Flowers, Primal Wear, and the Progressive Marketing Dynamics Group. Thank you very much to all of those sponsors. <clears throat> So again, we hope you enjoy the evening. I, I appreciate your time here at the beginning. We're gonna kick off the main program now and um, I'll hand it back to Bruce and I hope you enjoy yourselves. Thanks very much for coming. Thank you, thank you, Anthony. Again, President of the Board of Directors of the U.S. Bicycle Hall of Fame, thank you, Anthony. And again, what a great evening we have for us. Again, four inductees in our class of 2013. Anybody hungry? Anybody waiting for dinner? Dinner's coming. Dinner's coming. Now, some of you guys had a great ride. George, thank you very much for organizing the ride, taking the guys out and gals out there. We had some great seminars this morning as well. We had a Women's Cycling Federation. Is it Federation or Foundation, guys, gals? Women's Cycling Association get together. We also had Peter Rich chairing one of his very popular uh, roundtable discussions. And again, this year it was the 60s. So thank you very much, Peter, for doing that as well. But I got to tell you, I think it's time to get to the main event here and to recognize four extremely, I want to say, kind of, to be in the Hall of Fame. I mean, you know, a lot of us don't ever get to be in the Hall of Fame because we haven't made those contributions. We haven't made the significant contributions, but these four athletes and, and uh, bicycling luminaries have made those significant contributions to the sport of cycling. And the, the, the Hall recognizes riders back many, many years. So it's just not what happened last week at the Tour de France or what happened uh, two years ago. We're recognizing athletes and bicycling personalities who have been here, part of our uh, cycling for many, many, many years. And so it's really great. And I, I think uh, we should really recommend that we all embrace this. We have a nomination process. So if there's a, an athlete or a personality in the cycling industry that you think uh, you know, uh, is, is, is someone who should be recognized. There is a nomination process as well. So without further ado, we'd like to welcome our first Hall of Fame inductee, and we're going to play a video first, and then we'll have them come up and uh, give their acceptance speech. But we'd like to welcome our first inductee, Doris Trevani Mulligan. In 1940, the automobile factories of Detroit, Michigan were retooling to support the war effort. The U.S. National Amateur Bicycling Championships were held in Detroit in 1940, and Mildred Kugler won the Women's Bicycling Championship, and her brother Furman won the men's. They did not know it at the time, but another family living in Detroit in 1940 set its sights on following in the Kugler's cycling legacy. Doris Trevani was 11 years old in 1940, and she was born into a family with a deep cycling history. Her father, Alfred Trevani, was the national cycling champion of Italy in 1920. Alfred eventually became a grocer, but he made sure that his son Bob and daughter Doris inherited the cycling knowledge that he developed from years of racing. Doris started bicycling at the age of 12, and with her father as a coach, and her brother as a training partner, she quickly became a successful racer. She raced for the Wolverine Sports Club, and by the age of 17, Doris was competing in the 1946 National Bicycling Championships and finishing sixth. 
In 1947, Doris went to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and won her first Amateur Bicycle League National Women's Championship. It was there that she received support and encouragement from the legendary Pop Kugler, the father of Mildred and Furman Kugler, and the creator of the Tour of Somerville in New Jersey. While representing Michigan, Doris went on to win three more national championships in 1948, 1949, and 1950. Doris specialized in distances from one to five miles. Her favorite training partner was her brother Bob, who competed on the Olympic cycling sprint team in the 1948 London Olympics. Women cyclists were not even able to compete in the Olympics until 1984. In 1947, Doris won the International Dirt Bike Cycling Championships, and in 1948, she finished first in the International Sprint Championships held in Dayton, Ohio. After retiring from 10 years of competitive racing, Doris was called the queen of the nation's sprocketeers. Doris got married, became Doris Trevani Mulligan, and raised a family. When Doris was working as an attendant, in the children's home of Detroit, she embarked on a 3,300-mile pedal-for-power ride across the U.S. from Los Angeles to Boston. She was 60 years old at the time, and the children who she cared for encouraged her by crying out, Doris, you can do it! Doris competed in five national cycling championships and in two international championships. She was the first and only woman to this day to win four consecutive national cycling championships. Doris was inducted into the Michigan Amateur Sports Hall of Fame in 1974. The cycling world can now say, Doris, you did it. We'd like to welcome Doris. Doris, please come up to the podium. They said everything I wanted to say on that film there, but can, oh, here, this way, I, see, I'm not familiar with this, um, but I'm really honored and grateful to, uh, for this award, and I'm so proud to be here in this, this huge world of cycling. I've seen a few people, I've seen a few people that I know and some that I don't. Um, it's been over 60 years since my last race. Um, I'm still riding a bike, but I kind of really slow down a lot. <laughs> I belong to two bike club. I belong to two bike clubs in Michigan, the Wolverines and the, uh, the Clinton River Riders. And uh, when they, uh, in, you know, I do what I can to help them with their bike projects. When they built the uh, velodrome in uh, Rochester, uh, Michigan, uh, they gave me the assignment of painting all the steel posts and, <laughs> and the railings, which I gladly did. But that's my way of contributing to the cycling. Um, I have uh, many people to thank for my success, but they've all passed on. I'm <laughs> uh, first and foremost was my father. He was a bike rider in Italy, and he came to America. He got married, and he raised two kids. He started Bob off, my brother. Uh, with a bike, and then later on me. And um, uh, let's see, 
I'm not good at this, you know. Uh, my, my dad uh, provided everything. He provided the bicycles, the equipment, uh, the repairs, the trips that we took. And if it wasn't for my dad, I, I probably wouldn't be here today. So thanks, Dad, wherever you are. And then, of course, next was my brother. Um, he and I did a lot of training together. And um, uh, he was, of course, he was an excellent cyclist. I guess you saw in the video that he, he um, was on the 48 Olympics in London. And uh, he qualified for the Pan American Games. But he's passed on, too. So um, there's uh, also my coaches. Jean Portoese and Mike Walden, and a lot of my friends that I cycled with. Um, so, anyway, uh, I guess I'm the last of the peers. So, um, oh, and I have uh, I have uh, two people from Michigan here. Uh, that I want to recognize uh, and thank them for the help that they, they did in assembling my history, and that's uh, Bill and June, Julie Winhorst. Uh, so uh, to sum it all, I just want to say how honored, how humbled, and how overjoyed I am. Thank you. So thank you very much, Doris. Still the only female to win four consecutive national championships on a bike. Congratulations, Doris. Our second inductee crossed a couple different disciplines to uh, make his mark, and you'll see it in the video. So without further ado, let's bring up Mike King. Mike King, where are you? Come on up, Mike. We got the video. Well, let's wait first. Let's do the video, then we'll bring you up. Down the lead. King making a move. He's got it on the inside. Where's Charlie Townsend? Back there in that fifth spot. He's in trouble. The number one title moving away. Mikey King doing a little wing flap over the doubles. He's got the lead and the win in the second round of the pro main events. As a kid growing up in San Diego, Mike King loved riding his bicycle and watching his older brother Eddie race at the Silver Wing BMX track. One day, just before Mike turned six years old in 1975, he too decided to give racing a try. He was hooked immediately, and by the time that he was 13, Mike had decided to make bicycle motocross racing his career. Mike dominated age group races, and when he was 15, he became the American Bicycle Association's number one amateur in 1984. King turned professional in December of 1987 as an 18-year-old, and he won numerous awards and titles, including the 1987 Supercross World Pro-Am Champion and the 1988 ABA National Number 1 Pro. After his first professional season, Mike was named BMX Action's Rookie of the Year for 1988. Some even started calling him by a nickname, The Snake. He won the National Bicycle League A Pro Grand National Championships in 1989. King was also the 1994 and 1995 ABA Pro Cruiser Grand National Champion. In addition to racing for various sponsors, Mike, along with a fellow racer, helped start the clipless pedals trend in BMX racing in the mid-1990s. King began mountain biking in 1993 at the age of 24 and continued to compete in BMX races until 2002. Mike then raced mountain bikes exclusively until 2006 when he retired from competition. King was inducted into the American Bicycle Association's BMX Hall of Fame in 1999. 
Mike won numerous awards and titles in mountain biking, including the Norba 1993 Dual Slalom National Championships, and he was a gold medalist in the 1993 Mountain Bike World Championship downhill. Mike also won a bronze medal in the 2003 Mountain Bike World Cup Championships. King became the USA Cycling's BMX Program Director in 2002 in order to train Team USA for the 2008 Beijing Olympics and international competition. He led a successful program that won three Olympic medals, four Pan American medals, five World Championship titles, and 14 Supercross World Cup wins. Mike continues to support the bicycle racing industry by working as a BMX tire development manager. Mike King's amateur and professional racing career spanned over 30 years. He has won national and international acclaim for himself and for the teams that he has managed. It's been a great ride for that six-year-old who started racing on a dirt track back in San Diego, California. Now, let's bring up Mike King to the stage. Congratulations, Mike. Some of your former competitors right there, Toby Henderson. You've got to give him a shout out. Thanks, Mike. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first, I want to thank the U.S. Bicycling Hall of Fame for hosting this event, the board of directors, and the sponsors. Um, this is a definite uh, experience that I will always cherish. And it is really, for me personally, a very humbling honor to be here this evening. I promise not to bore any of you guys with my race results over the last 30 years. Um, that's why we have this, uh, this uh, manual or of sorts for, for everyone to read. But I do want to recognize some people that aren't with us this evening. Um, my father, Dennis King, passed away 19 years ago. And he was someone that uh, was very proud of obviously my accomplishments, but also of my older brother, Eddie, who I'll talk, talk about later. But I know he's here with us this evening, and um, I know, uh, like I said, he, he would be very proud to, to be here this evening, and, and um, I miss him dearly. And he was a big part of, of who I am today. So, Dad, I know you're here, so cheers, and... Thank you. Another person that's not with us this evening is my brother. Uh, unfortunately, seven weeks ago, he was in a mountain bike uh, crash, and he's recovering from a spinal cord injury. Uh, we had some pretty exciting plans for this weekend. Matter of fact, I think it was a seven-day trip. Um, and, you know, as, as growing up as a kid, having a, an older brother, you learn a lot. I think for the first 15 years, I, I probably wanted to kill the guy because he, he always beat me at, at everything and anything because he was obviously physically stronger and faster. But I learned, and, and uh, you know, he was my hero. So... Um, Eddie, I wish he was here so I could acknowledge to him how much he meant to me and how much uh, he's groomed me. You know, he was my training partner. He was, he was a huge part of my life. And, you know, if, if we were doing sprints or gate starts or lifting weights together, I always made sure that uh, I did a little extra more after the fact, and he never saw that. So... He, he definitely inspired me to be the very best and to, um, you know, reach for your, for your dreams. Um, the other 
person I want to acknowledge is my three-year-old son, Mason. Today's his third birthday. <laughs> my family noticed that uh, he looks just like my dad, so uh, again, um, I wish he could be here this evening with my daughter, but uh, I'm afraid they'd be a, a bit out of control running around, so um, I promise to take him back up here in the near future to show him uh, some of the artifacts that I'll, that I'll have displayed. So, so based on the career, I want to definitely thank some people that meant a lot to me in the bicycle industry. Uh, Bob Harrow was one of the pioneers and one of the godfathers of BMX freestyle. And he was one of the first guys that, that took me on board as a BMX racer. And I got a, a monthly salary out of that at the age of 18. So um, I guess my real job went into effect in 1988. And I want to thank Bob for providing me that opportunity to travel the world and to, um, you know, sell more, more bikes in some ways. So thank you, Bob. Um, Harry Larry was another individual that meant a lot to me. He gave me an opportunity to cross over into mountain bike racing. And I remember, I remember some athletes at the trade show telling me how mountain biking was going to be the future and how there was a lot of money involved. And it definitely perked my interest. And I figured, well, I've been riding a bike for almost 20 years by now. It can't be that hard. Trust me, it was hard. And it was very humbling at first. Um, my first mountain bike experience was at Big Bear. And let's just say when my chain broke, I was, I was happy that my day was over. <laughs> but... The next race, we were in Indiana, and of all places, Indiana, right? Ski resort in Indiana. And I had a breakthrough race. I finished, uh, I think, 11th. And from that point forward, I knew I, knew I could do it. Um, back then, suspension was just now entering into the mountain bike industry. And a lot of the technology that we currently see now is, was, was non-existent. But make a long story short, my ninth race, I was in France for the, BMA, or for the Mountain Bike World Championships, and I had nothing to lose. No one expected me to win. I believe I had two other podiums on the Norba circuit. And it was definitely one of the most memorable days and evenings of my career where... I literally just went as hard as I could, and I won the world championships my first year. So, yeah, that is something that will stick with me to this day. It was my ninth mountain bike race, and I won the big one. So, uh, the other people that I want to quickly acknowledge um, Rich Long, GT Bicycles. And Doug Martin, he was the team director of our mountain bike program. After I won the world championships, um, they provided me with uh, probably the biggest contract that I'd ever signed at that time. And I was part of the super team with uh, Julie Furtado, Rishi Graywall, Andre. Um, I really felt like I had made it. And it was uh, just an unreal experience. Uh, fortunately, Richard Long passed away in 1996, as some of you may or may not know. Uh, Richard was a big part of um, my success with GT, and it was, it was really exciting to kind of see how people worked for that guy. Everyone loved Richard, including myself. He always seemed to... He always seemed to, to know about you and ask questions. He would come up and... He would ask how, you know, my brother was doing and things of that nature. So, uh, Richard, thank you. Um, and then I'd also like to acknowledge Brad Lusky. Brad Lusky was someone at Haro Bikes that recruited me back to the company. 
to start their mountain bike program, which later turned into a team director role. And I was very excited about that opportunity. A lot of, I learned a lot from Doug Martin, and I was able to kind of take some of that knowledge and, and help with not only a downhill program, but also with a cross-country program. I want to acknowledge my mom who's here, Mama King. <laughs> Thank you for supporting my dreams, for driving me all over the country, Eddie and I, working a full-time job to put food on the table, and for being a wonderful grandmother to my children. I love you. Thank you for everything that you've been. And lastly, I want to acknowledge my beautiful wife, Carrie. She missed out on those golden years, as I like to say. But perhaps it was for the best because I was very focused and driven. And she's been through this transition from professional athlete to, I guess, business professional. She's been through the thick and thin of it. And I owe, I owe her the world for her patience, her understanding, and her unconditional love. You're an amazing mother to our two kids. You accept my hectic travel schedules, because they, they still occur. And you allow me to ride my bike as much as possible, which, let's face it, that's why we're all here. So, I love you. And thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. All right, Mike King. Thank you very much, Mike. Well, we're getting along on our program. At this point in time, I think we want to bring up, well, at the time, to remind you about our silent auction that we have going on. You're enjoying your dinners. We're going to take a little admission, intermission here. But again, the silent auction will end, I'm guessing, about half hour from now. We're going to get into our live auction. And just as we start our next set of inductees, our inductees number three and number four, we'll close our silent auction. So this is about a 15, 20-minute intermission for you to bar little boy's room, little girl's room, uh, enjoy your food, and just kind of hang out, and we'll come back with the rest of the program, and our, including our live auction, in about 20 minutes. So enjoy yourselves. Thank you very much to our two inductees already, Doris and Mike, and we've got two more to go. Thank you. All right, if we can please get everybody to return to your seats. We are closing our auction in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay, come on back to your seats now. We are closing the, the uh, silent auction, so please come back. We'll begin the second half of our program. Silent auction is officially closed. So come on back and find your seats, and let's get in the second half of our program because we have two other very deserving inductees into the 
U.S. Bicycling Hall of Fame, and we want to bring them up on stage as well. So if Eric could please find their seats. At this time, I'd like to welcome Brody Hamilton. Brody, one of our event organizers. Come on up on stage, Brody. Let's go up for Brody, one of our event organizers here, and fellow UC Davis graduate, class of 1974. Once an Aggie, always an Aggie. All right, my man. Thank you. Does this work? Yeah. Well, I'm excited that I'm up here because I've made a point of not having any wine yet because... Had I had wine, I wouldn't be able to read these little notes that Bob Bowen gave me. Anyway, um, I'm on the board, and I had the pleasure of being the uh, chair of the planning committee for the induction weekend. And I wanted to say some thank yous, because as you all know, an event like this doesn't happen without a lot of people and time and energy. And in our case, virtually all of them were volunteers. Um, from within the uh, community here. Our planning committee was made up of uh, Sabrina Vigil, Bob Bowen, Matt Dulcich, Dave Kemp, John Hess, and Jeff Shaw. Did I miss anybody? No, yes. So a big thank you to those folks who put in lots of hours over the last five, six, seven months. Uh, lots of effort trying to uh, pull uh, memorabilia and information out of the inductees, which sometimes is a bit of a challenge, especially, Vince, your stuff was from so long ago. You know, it was falling apart when we got it. But we got some great pictures, and, and uh, uh, some of which is in the, uh, the program this evening. I wanted to echo uh, a thank you to uh, uh, Sabrina that uh, Anthony provided. She just handled so many details to make sure this happened. It's one thing to be overseeing uh, an effort, but the person who really took care of so many of the details was Sabrina. So thank you, Sabrina. <clears throat> and also a really special thank you to Bob Bowen, who uh, did so many things related to this event. It is just amazing. A look at the material that's in the brochure. You look at the material that's in the videos, and that was Bob Bowen's voice in the videos as well. Just a jack of all trades. He just put together so many things and put in so many hours. So a big thank you to Bob Bowen for his efforts. Just <laughs> phenomenal over there. Super stuff. Also want to thank uh, uh, the rest of the Bowen family. They've been helping us for the last six years, putting in uh, just an incredible number of hours. So Kate Bowen and the family, Ernie, uh, no, Peter DeHaan. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Kate Bowen's uh, mother wasn't able to make it tonight, so you won't get that dance. I'm sorry. She is? Oh, you will get that dance later tonight, apparently. Okay to the highest bidder, of course, and we expect you to be bidding on that as well. Uh, a thank you to uh, Larry Swanson for coordinating, uh, working with Pacific Auction Company and coordinating our auction tonight. Jeff Shaw and the incredible staff over at um, Davis uh, Media Access, uh, they're doing all the video stuff here tonight. Uh, they helped put the programs together and uh, the videos and just have done an outstanding job. Bruce Gallaudet with uh, the Davis Enterprise. We've had unprecedented coverage this year. Just amazing. I, there must have been 10 different articles in the paper uh, uh, through the uh, last probably six weeks or so. Uh, several features on each of the individual inductees, some that covered the whole event. And uh, so thank you to the Davis Enterprise and uh, Bruce Gallaudet for that. Uh, also uh, to Peter Rich, who organized the Veteran uh, uh, Writer Seminar today. That's always a great event, well attended. It gives us a great opportunity to uh, uh, record information from some wonderful uh, historic figures in the world of cycling, and it's uh, sort of an ongoing effort for uh, 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 oral history efforts, so uh, thank you to Peter for that. John Hess for uh, coordinating our VIP reception last night, pulled off really well. And uh, George Mount for leading the ride to uh, Winters today. George, 
Hopefully you didn't get too, uh, too winded on that. Yeah. A uh, couple others, uh, one is Bill Rowe. Uh, he uh, brought over his uh, photographic expertise to help record some things. He also designed our latest uh, uh, Hall of Fame jersey and the uh, commemorative jerseys that are up for uh, sale at the auction, which is closed. But uh, you'll be able to come by our gift shop and get some there as well. And uh, Bill Bruner, who helped uh, put into uh, the appropriate digital format all of the uh, um, programs that, uh, that you see here and got them ready for uh, printing for us. And lastly, uh, Jane, uh, ja, Jane, Jane, Jason, you're here, aren't you? I sure. Um, for uh, setting up the uh, forum that we had today, the, the uh, Women's Cycling Association. Yeah, you got that? All right. So, and that was, uh, that was a great seminar at the Hall of Fame today. So um, with that, thank you to the Freeborn staff. Thank you to the caterers. Uh, wonderful event. And uh, on to the next session. Bye-bye. Well, thank you to Brody there again. This time we have one of the favorite portions of the evening for me because it's the live auction. It's a time when we get to get up here and ask you to bid generously on some great memorabilia, some great opportunities. And I'd like to bring our auctioneer up here from Pacific Auctions, C.J. Brantley. Everybody ready for a live auction? Everybody want to get some great memorabilia? The first thing we have to auction off, speaking of great memorabilia, is an HTC Columbia jersey. Anybody remember this team? Bob Stapleton squad? These guys won 30, 40, 50 races a year, Tour de France stages, Giro d'Italia, Tour of California. This jersey is signed by most of the team, including TJ Van Garden, winner of the Tour of California this year, and the USA Pro Challenge. Mark Cavendish, the Manx man, before he switched teams. Andre Greipel has won about five or six stages of Tour de France lately, and many, many more of the members of the HCC Columbia team. So team disbanded in 2010, they are no longer here, so this definitely is a piece of unforgettable memorabilia. CJ, take it away. Thanks, Bruce. I appreciate that. All right, folks, you heard what it is here. If you haven't been to an auction, it's real simple. I'm going to talk real fast. I need to see a hand nice and high in the air if you want to help us raise some money, okay? Right here on the first item is the HTC Columbia jersey. What do you say right here? Would anybody like to open the bidding? Let's say $700. Hey, anybody want to go $700? I'm bid seven player. Take it at $700. And a seven player bid it at $700. And a bid it at seven player. $700. I'm bid $700. And a bid it at seven player. Take it at $700. Now, seven now. Anybody want to go $700? $700? It's okay, folks. Just like uh, we had in our silent auction, this item does have a minimum bid. Would anybody in the room like to bid? At our minimum bid on this item of $500, you couldn't cover the framing and the mat work. Hand stitch that jersey has to be stitched into that mat to get the lines right. It's a very, very nice item, very well framed. Hands in the air, help us make some money at $500. Anybody want to go five pair, bid it at $500, five pair, and five, bid it at $500, 500, 500. Okay, we'll move right along. That's no big problem, folks. I know when we throw stuff in a live auction, it comes at you real quick. So if you want to think about it, that's fine. Conversate at your tables. You can come talk to me or any of my auction staff here after the auction, and we'll get it taken care of for you, okay? All right, next slot, Bruce. Well, again, that is a one-of-a-kind jersey. The team has disbanded. And look at these guys, Cavendish, Greipel. You could have their signatures on a beautiful jersey. Second item up for bid is an Amgen Tour California fan experience package. Two VIP hospitality passes and one VIP car ride on the Amgen Tour California stage of your choice during this year's Amgen Tour California course. Starts in Sacramento, goes to Folsom, San Jose, Mount Diablo, out there at Monterey, heads down the coast to, uh, to uh, Seaside, that whole area. Gets down there by Santa Barbara, heads over to Santa Clarita. Big mountain stage down there in Southern California. So if you're in Northern California or Southern California, it's a great opportunity to be in a VIP team car and see the Amgen Tour of California up close and personal. The morning VIP package at the breakfast area where we have all the riders coming by to sign in and all that kind of stuff is a very, very fun as well. So, again, if you want to experience the Amgen Tour of California up close and personal, this is definitely a way to do it. And, again, Folsom Stage, you could be in a team car for the time trial. You could be a team car for the stage in Sacramento. You could go up Mount Diablo. You could go up the big climb down in Southern California. Your choice of the stage. This is a great, a very unforgettable experience. So, CJ, take us away. 
All right, thanks, Bruce. Well, you heard the man right there, the VIP car right here. What do you say, folks? Let's have some fun. How about $100? Anybody like to bid? $100 to go. $100. Now, one pair, but one. $25. Bucks. How about $25? Bucks? Someone's got to do $25. $25 bid. Now, $50. Now to give $75, sir. $50. And I want $75. Now to give $100. Now, one pair, but one. Now, your turn. On one bid. Now, quarter. I bid $100. Now, quarter down, quarter down. $125 and a quarter dollar. Bid a quarter dollar. Done. $125. $25. $25. $25. To the word. Now, quarter. I bid $100. And I want quarter dollar down. $1. Bid a quarter down. $125. Now to give a quarter dollar. One and a quarter. Now you got to be half here. One fifty, your man's out here. One and a half, one and a quarter bid. Now to give half a dollar down. One hundred and fifty. Anybody else want in at one hundred and fifty? I have one twenty-five in the back. One fifty to go, sir. Thank you, ma'am. At one fifty, now to give seventy-five. She says, "Take that, buddy." One fifty, and I want seventy-five now. One fifty, now to give seventy-five. Seventy-five, seventy-five, seventy-five. Dollar where now? Seventy-five. Dollar better five. Dollar where now? Five. I bid one and a half. Would you do one sixty? One sixty bid. Now seventy, ma'am. It's like checkers. Your move here. One sixty, and I want seventy. I bid one hundred and sixty. Now to give seventy dollar down. One seventy now. One seventy. Gotta go here. It's an auction now. One seventy bid. Now to give eighty dollar now one eighty one seventy and one eighty dollar now take it at eighty one hundred and eighty now one seventy and one eighty now ninety I'm bid one eighty now to give ninety one ninety one ninety 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 one ninety one ninety one hundred and ninety dollar bit of ninety now one ninety now to give ninety one eighty and I'm one ninety now two hundred I'm bid one hundred one ninety now to give two hundred dollar now take it down take it down two dollar where now take it at two I'm bid one hundred and ninety dollar bit of two now two hundred dollar gotta go here one ninety now to give two now to give two now to give two where I'm with the lady at one hundred and ninety anybody else want to bid two hundred one ninety gotta go boys one ninety two bid now ten I'm bid two hundred to ten now twenty I'm bid 220, 220, 210 bid, now 220 bid, 220, now 30. I'm at 220, 220, 30, now 30. Ma'am, you're out here. I'm at 220, now to give 30. 230, 220, and I'm on 30. 10 bucks here, 220, now to give 30, dollar, 230 bid, now 40. I'm at 240, 230, now 40, 40, 240, 240, 240, 230, now to give 40. You're both out. I gotta go here, boys and girls. 230, now to give 40, 230, and now to give 40. You're out in the back there, 240. 230, do you want it now? 240, 240, sold out for $230. Sold out for $230 right there, ma'am. You bought it. Thank you very much. We sure do appreciate it. Now that feels like an auction, doesn't it? All right, that feels good there. To... All right, next, folks. All right, folks, lot number three right here. We have, anybody heard of the Beatles? Yeah, there you go. We have right here, this is a one-of-a-kind item, folks. This is a Paul McCartney hand-signed guitar. That's right, hand-signed by one of the best songwriters in the history of music. This guy right here, not only was a member of the Beatles, but more than, was it like 3,200 bands have covered his music that he's written. Just an unbelievable member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Right here, certificate of authenticity right there on the back. The opening bid on the guitar is $1,500. Do I have $1,500? I'm at $1,500. Where? Bid at $1,500. Folks, just like everything this evening, this is an S. Paul McCartney. There you go. Right here, this guitar, folks, is about an estimated about $3,200 to $3,500 value. The opening bid tonight is $1,500. It's a great display piece, a one-of-a-kind item. We have brought it here to you today, $1,500. First hand gets it. $1,500, now to get $15, $1,005. I bid $1,500, now to get $15, $15, $15, $100, now $15. Where bid it at $15, now $15, $15, and $1,500. Anybody want to go $15, $15, $15, and $1,500, $1,005? I got to go here, $1,500. All right, we'll move right along. Anybody interested in the guitar? I know I've talked to a couple people in the crowd. It's no problem. If you want to discuss about that guitar, it's still going to be here. The proceeds still go to help the Hall of Fame, our Hall of Fame, and we're going to move right along. All right, folks, right here, next lot we have, this is the Miracle, it's called the Miracle on Ice piece, but if anybody knows anything about the 1980 Olympic team and what uh, happened there with the Miracle on Ice and the ice hockey tournament in the Olympics, uh, Russia pretty much dominated ice hockey for a very long time, especially in the, on the world, uh, world stage. This was a team of amateurs, college students from the United States that didn't really have a shot, but they came together. Probably one of the greatest moments in sports history. This is signed, folks, by all 20 members of that team. So this is a pretty tough item to get your hands on, if you can imagine. One of a kind, truly a one-of-a-kind item here tonight, folks. Hand-signed by all 20 members of the team with a certificate of authenticity. I bet you don't see another one. The time to buy something good is when you see it. So right here, folks, the opening bid of $800. Who wants to go on possibly a $1,600 to a $2,000 to value, depending on who you get to appraise it? At $800 here today, folks, we can help raise some money for the Hall of Fame. 800 
Anybody want to go 800? 800, 800, got to go, 800. All right, we'll push it along there, 800. <laughs> Folks, if you want to talk about the miracle on ice piece, no big deal. Please come up and talk to us, and uh, we'll get you taken care of. All right, so I noticed during the silent auction there's some, there uh, has been some bids on some of our trips this evening, and I can tell you that these trips are, 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 are truly first class. And this item in our live auction today is one of those trips that is definitely, definitely one of the best in our pocket. This is an 18th century Italian farmhouse in the heart of Italy, not for 100 bucks. <laughs> this place is eight days, seven nights, five bedroom, three bathroom, sleeps 10 people. You're within driving, you're within driving distance of art galleries, wineries. I mean, all the beautiful castles and museums. I mean, it's just an unbelievable place to take a vacation. This is not a timeshare, folks. This place is a farmhouse that books 52 weeks a year. You have 18 months from today's date to book your trip. It books Saturday to Saturday. So an Ita a restored 18th century Italian farmhouse for seven nights, eight days in Italy. All right, folks. Right here, just like our other trips, this has brought in a tremendous value. Opening bid on the Italian farmhouse is $3,000. Would anybody bid $3,000? If you got 10 buddies or 10 friends or 10 family members, it's a really great value, folks. $3,000. When this trip books direct, it books for about $5,500 to $6,000. Opening bid at $3,000. Anybody want to go 3,000? I'm bid three, where take it at 3,000, dollar bid at three, where take it at 3,000, 3,000, 3,000, and 3,000, where bid at 3,000. Think about it now, 3,000, not take it at, take it at 3,000, 3,000, gotta go here, 3,000. All right, we'll move it right along, folks. If anybody has any questions about the farmhouse, I know it takes a while to get 10 people on the phone or 10 people at your table to agree, so please talk about it. We're not, uh, we don't want to pressure you, we don't want to make it, a, it's not, a, we're not getting in a real huge hurry, so um, just come on up and talk to us. All right, folks, this will be our last item of the evening. This item, I'm not going to auction this item off. This is, a very, this is a very special item. And you know what? Some of, some of us, you know, just like myself, I can't, you know, find the money sometimes at the, at the right, par, uh, right parts of the year. And we know the holidays are coming up and everybody's getting down to the end of the year and getting strapped. But right here, this is an opportunity and a great trip here. I'd, I'd take a listen. This is our Las Vegas getaway. This is... This is for three days, two nights in Vegas. Now, there are some stipulations with this trip. Three days, two nights in Vegas. It's Sunday through Thursday. It's your choice of a, of a whole array of hotels there. My favorite hotel on that list is the Tropicana. Just underwent a $250 million restoration. That is on that list. It's also good for the Harvey's Hotel in Lake Tahoe, the Harrah's in Reno, and the Aquarius in Laughlin. Now, with this, with this package... You not only get the two nights and three days at the hotel, you get buy one, get one free airfare, any airline in the United States. So folks, you don't, my, my point is you don't have to use the buy one, get one free airfare for Vegas. You can drive up to Tahoe, stay at the Harvey's, use your airfare and fly to Hawaii for buy one, get one free. Or you can use your airfare and go to New York. You can do whatever you'd like within the United States. So. I'm not going to auction this item off. Um, you have to make your reservations 30 days. I have to say this, folks, or you're going to come after me. You have to make your res reservations 30 days before your trip, which is no big deal. And there will be a $10 fee when you get your vouchers. The vouchers, it's a $500 cashback casino vouchers. They're awesome vouchers. Buy one, get one free dinners, free casino gaming points. It's a whole cool deal. Now, with all that said, bottom line, two nights in Vegas, three days, Buy one, get one free airfare anywhere in the United States. Who would like that for $250? Raise your hand in the air if you would like to take it home for $250. There's one. There's two. Anybody else? I have two people who like to go to Vegas for $250. And you get that airfare, folks. There's three. There's four. Keep those hands nice and high as my runners can come get you. There's four. Anybody else? There's five. Thank you. Anybody else? If you could do the math, these dollars are adding up for the Hall of Fame really quick. We have five people going to Vegas. Anybody else hold that hand up right here for 250 You could buy multiples, folks, but the buy one, get one free airfare is definitely worth it. 250 250 Yes. 250 bucks. There it is. Six and seven. 
Any more? Any more, folks? All right. Well, that's it for me. I want to say thank you very much. If I would ask everybody who just bought the Vegas trip, please put your hands in the air. Keep them up there till one of my guys comes and sees you. Once he, they come and see you, please put your hand down. But I want to say thank you so much for bidding. Any of the items in the auction that didn't get a bid in the silent as well as the live, you can come up and more than, um, we're more than welcome to give us the minimum bid. And um, auction checkout's going to be right in the main entrance. So whenever we're done here this evening and you bought some, if you bought something in the silent, we'll have it alphabetized by last name and come on up and see us. So that's it for me. Thank you, guys. I hope I stayed within the program's uh, limits. But. Thanks, Bruce. Thank you. From Pacific Auction, C.J. Brantley. Thank you very much, C.J. So I'm not supposed to tell too many stories this evening, but I got to tell you a story about restoring an 18th century Italian farmhouse. Does anybody remember the first American to ever win the Giro d'Italia, Andy Hamston? Well, Andy bought an 18th century farmhouse in Italy, called me up and said, hey, can you come help me restore the thing? And so we would ride in the morning and then work in the afternoon till dark and past dark restoring this, this uh, farmhouse. But one day he really wanted to take this piece of marble out and place it in this special location. He really wanted to get back. So it's middle of winter. He takes this shortcut to get us back quicker, and we get so horribly lost. We are out there in the back roads of Italy for like six or seven hours on our bikes. And by the time we got home, I was in bed for three days after that. But it was a lot of fun, and Andy had this great farmhouse in Italy. And uh, restoration isn't so bad. But I got to tell you, I, I like the biking a lot more than digging holes in Italian dirt. So anyways, enough of those stories. It's time to resume our program and induct our final two members of the class of 2013. At this time, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our third inductee, Beth Hyden reed a world champion in three different sports. Terrific race. Oh, thank you. I really um, put everything ahead. <laughs> Beth Hyden-Reed is one of the most gifted and dynamic multi-sport athletes to ever compete in the United States. She has excelled in speed skating, cross-country skiing, and bicycle racing. Born in Madison, Wisconsin, Beth originally took up cycling as part of her cross-training for speed skating. We did a lot of summer activities, and one of them was biking, and my brother started going to bike races because of this uh, training we were doing. And then my dad started training um, with us when we did our biking. And he started going to the bike races, and they were having a lot of fun. And So that's sort of what drew me in. Beth rode in the 1979 National Cycling Championships while riding in the junior division. I qualified for nationals at that race and showed up at nationals still not owning any of the right stuff, but my dad lent me a pair of bike shorts and Connie Carpenter lent me one of our, our jerseys from our team. And um, I went to the starting line all decked out and lo and behold, the chief referee of our race standing there at the line looks at me and says, oh, I see you got some bike clothes and some bike shoes. And all the other girls on the starting line turn and stare at me. <laughs> And one girl says, what did you used to wear, honey? I was like, oh, no. <laughs> Compared to today's sponsored racers, Beth had to rely on luck and connections to obtain a proper racing bicycle. I um, went to the Red Singer uh, Bicycle Classic in Colorado, which at the time was the biggest stage race for women in the world. And I didn't really have much of a bike. I had bought a used bike for 200 bucks that I was racing on and it was too big for me. The front fork was bent. A uh, bicyclist named John Howard who was on the Olympic team in the early 70s. He was one of the, the very first um, really good international cyclists we had since uh, way back in Major Taylor days. He saw me. He was working with Exxon and they were making the very first graphite bikes and he said, say I I can give you a frame. Would you like that? And I was like, oh my gosh. And then when I rode in the World Championships in 1980 in France, on our team was Miji Riak, who was really the mother of competitive cycling and in this country. 
and she took me aside and coached me and she gave me every tip she could think of and which was years worth of um, riding advice because she felt that I had a chance to win and when I won that race I think Miji was even happier than I was then it was totally biking that's when I got my serious uh, streak in biking and had a very serious summer with a lot of good results Beth indeed had some good results in 1980 in fact they were record-breaking after winning a bronze medal in the 3,000 meter speed skating event in the 1980 Winter Olympics in Lake Placid, Beth won the U.S. Road Racing Championship in 1980 in Arizona. She went on to win the 1980 World Road Championship title in France. Haydn was also the overall women's division winner of the Coors Classic stage race in 1980. By the end of 1980, she was named Sportswoman of the Year by the U.S. Olympic Committee. She now lives in Northern California with her husband and three children. She has an undergraduate degree in math and a master's degree in science in civil engineering. Now known as Beth Hyden Reed, she rides a bicycle daily to her work at Apple Computers. Biking is a big part of my life. Um, my competitive career was pretty small, but um, my whole life revolves around bikes, whether it's commuting, um, going on vacation. My ideal of a vacation is a bike tour. Um, I put my kids out of their bikes. Um, everything's done on a bike in this family. I'd now like to welcome to the podium Beth Hyden Reed. Well, I like the new uh, slogan for Davis. I like bikes, <laughs> and I like seeing bikes. Um, I think that's why I get along so well with my husband. We have a lot of bikes in our house, um, and biking has always been a part of my life, probably like everybody in this room. Um, we're all bikers. I biked to, to school when I was a kid. I biked to the beach. I biked everywhere. I biked on the golf course, on the fairways. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> we, we love to ride. Um, but I didn't really get into competitive cycling until um, I'd already been a speed skater because we were doing a lot of um, training in the summertime that involved other activities because there was no ice. And um, so we were running and weight training and biking. And we had a really great local club. And uh, we had a weekly... Uh, race out on the other side of town that the club put on real informally and um, in fact you know our MC tonight Bruce Hildenbrand was the president of our club he was a grad student at the University of Wisconsin and um, he got everybody going I was it was great and he said hey you know we got some races here in uh, the state and if you ride in this race you can qualify for nationals. And so he sort of organized us to like, you know, find out where the races were and um, get to them. And uh, I, I did ride some races in the state of Wisconsin where I lived. And it started out with some, um, the races were always held with the men. They, they never had a separate women's category um, start. And so I rode a lot with the threes and fours, which is really dangerous, actually. There was a lot of crashing all the time. You know, they, they didn't know how to take a corner. Um, and, uh, the problem was, you know, these guys were pretty strong because they were men, but they didn't have the technical skills. And um, it, it was a little risky. But um, fortunately, Bruce steered me toward the state championships, which was just a women's race. And um, I went there, and I won it and qualified to go to nationals. And um, that was a pretty big deal. It was way out in Washington. But um, I had been running into problems going to these threes and fours races because they were official USSA sanctioned races. And I showed up in my blue cycling shorts. My mother had made me some shorts. And I didn't own a bike jersey, but that wasn't a problem. You just had to, it was official that you had to have black shorts and white socks. And um, I was running afoul of the rules. And the um, technical delegate said, hey, you know, you got to get some uh, 
black shorts or you can't race next time. And I showed up at the next race and he said, <clears throat> uh, the blue shorts got to go. This is the second call, third time you're not starting. And I was like, oh boy. So the third race was going to be um, all the way out in Seattle, actually. And so I borrowed my dad's bike shorts, which were black. They didn't fit, but they were black. And um, I had been wearing, I didn't really own a pair of bike shoes, but I had a pair of tennis shoes that had an extra insole um, glued on the bottom near the, the sole of my foot. And then my dad took a file and made a slit in it. So it worked with those old toe straps. You know, the, the pedal would fit right in that slit, and then the toe strap would go over the top. Worked pretty well. Um, but I didn't, um, I didn't have a jersey to ride at Nationals, so Connie Carpenter, who was also from Madison on our team, um, said, well, here, you can borrow mine because it fit better than my dad's. And um, <laughs> so there was, I was wearing Connie's jersey, my dad's bike shorts, and my brother's old hockey helmet. Um, and I got a new pair of bike shoes that were all black, and I was really pleased. And I got to the starting line, and I was so bummed that the Wisconsin rep was there as the referee. And he was giving the, we all came to the line, all the women in the junior race, and he was giving us the rules. And that's when he said to me something, you know, that totally embarrassed me. Um, <laughs> and he said, oh, I see you got some bike shoes. And oh, it was, it was so crushing, all those other women <laughs> looking at me and going, what you used to wear and oh but you know what I think that's why I did so well in that race I realized I gotta show myself here and um it was a hilly course uh, I did well I went off the front with a rider from Indiana named Dana and um it was the first time I sort of met Wayne and Dale Stetna who were out on the course cheering for Dana <laughs> <laughs> which was really actually pretty nice. And I had Connie Carpenter out there cheering for me. Um, I went across the line and I, I won the race, put my hand up, I was pretty thrilled. I knew you were supposed to put your hands up when you went across the finish line. And that was the first time I'd ever been in a women's race, so it was the first time I'd ever won a race. And, um, but the junior boys were there and they said, hey, you know, you're supposed to put your both hands up. I'm like, well, I can't do that on my bike because it has a bent fork, and if I put both hands up, I'd crash. <laughs> but anyway, I had a lot of support from bikers through the years, and that's really why I, I did well in cycling. Um, you know, the following year was when John Howard showed up with a bike frame for me in Boulder, Colorado, just before the start of the um, Red Zinger uh, stage race. And... Uh, of course, this frame didn't come with any components on it, but uh, one of the, um, uh, the mechanics for the U.S. men's cycling team, Bill Woodall, said, hey, sweet pea, I can put it together for you. And it was, this guy with his southern drawl said he would do this, and I was like, wow, this is awesome. But he's a real talker. He, he would, I would go to uh, see how my bike was doing, and he would just talk and talk, and my bike wasn't getting put together, and I'm like, Bill! <laughs> Come on. But he'd say, don't worry about it, sweet pea. It's going to be fine. <laughs> but he got it together before, the night before the race, rode on it. Everything was good, of course, because he did it. And um, from then on, I, they spent the rest of the summer on this wonderful graphite bike that John Howard had gotten for me. Um, what, another example of my fellow competitors, um, you know, helping me out was I, I was heading to the um, National Time Trial Championship with uh, Connie Carpenter and George Mount, and I got my bike out of the car and was putting the wheels um, on my bike, and George took a look at them and thought, boy, you know, you, you, you got to do something with these. I mean, I'll, I'll fix them up for you. I'll fix them. I was like, I didn't know anything was wrong with them, and he fixed them, and they rolled better, and I won. <laughs> Thank you, George. <laughs> I think Connie was a little disappointed that day. Um, <laughs> but Connie got second because George fixed my wheels. <laughs> but that was, it was really sweet. He just stepped in and did that. Um, I have examples like that throughout my, my brief cycling career, and I just feel fortunate. Um, 
You know, I went to the World Championships the first time in Germany, and um, I sat down to breakfast, and Dale Stetna was sitting next to me. The Dale Stetna, one of the Stetna brothers. I had actually made a team, um, and one of the, you know these bike luminaries were on it, and um, that was the day I learned that it's important what you eat when you're a bike racer. I, I was eating a hard-boiled egg, and I was like done eating my egg, and Dale says to me, um, do you want your eggshells? I'm like, no. Can I have them? Sure, Dale, have my eggshells. Well, Dale ate them. <laughs> That's how serious he was about his diet, and I thought, oh, <laughs> Ha! <laughs> I get it. <laughs> you need to be serious about your diet. And when, when I was back riding that first race against Dana and Dale and Wayne were cheering for her, they, they were giving her hints, you know, make her pull, make her pull. And I'm thinking, hmm, that means I probably shouldn't pull so much. Hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it, it was a... I was so fortunate to be amongst these really top bikers. And when I went to the World Championships in 1980, and it was super hilly, um, I was actually fortunate because the women in this country didn't get much of a chance to ride big major uh, competitions against others as a team. And you really need to learn to work as a team by practicing in races, you know, your team tactics. And uh, the course in France was just a mammoth mountain. Uh, Bernard Hinault had picked the course, and so he picked the toughest thing he could find. And there really weren't any team tactics to be had. You just had to kill yourself. You know, whoever was willing to suffer the most was going to win. And um, we had been assigned a coach um, who didn't really know anything about biking, unfortunately. Um, but that was pretty typical for the women. Probably the men didn't have it much better either at that time. But um, one of my fellow uh, competitors, Miji Riak, who is also in the Hall of Fame, um, she took me aside and she knew that I had a really good chance of winning that race if I could keep my head on straight. And we were all kind of nervous about that uh, course because we had to make this climb about four times. And it, w it was a killer. And so she, she told me, think dancing feet dancing feet and I'm like dancing feet how can my feet dance up that thing <laughs> but fortunately she had some other really good ideas for me because that one didn't work but um, uh, it was it was so wonderful to have her support and um, I ran into a slight problem there my bike didn't show up but there was George Mount down the road Smiling George, don't worry about it, everything's gonna be fine. <laughs> and sure enough, a bike, I had several bikes show up uh, for me. Various people brought things in and uh, my bike arrived just in the nick of time and I was able to ride on it. But I think the happiest person that day when I won the World Championships was Miji Riak. And so I think a large part of my success and the reason I'm inducted into this Hall of Fame is Miji Riak, and I want, just want to say thank you to her. She meant a lot. And I'm really honored to be here today, and I love biking, and I love Davis for that reason, and thank you. All right, Beth Hyden-Reed. I, I got to tell you a story about her winning the Worlds, because... I don't, remember Wide World of Sports? Remember every Saturday they had Wide World of Sports? When Beth won, they decided they were going to put that on Wide World of Sports. So they flew Beth to New York with Chris Sankel doing the commentary. So they had this clip of Beth winning the World Championships. And the clip comes on TV, and there's Beth in this four-rider breakaway. So there's Beth and three other women. Beth's taking her pull at the front, and Chris Sankel, who knows nothing about cycling, comes on and says, All right, Beth, that looks really good. You're right there in the front leading the race. Well, Beth gets done taking her pull. It starts to drop back. You know, when you drop back, if you're done taking your pull, you're just kind of taking it easy. Chris Schenkel's like, Beth, now, now you're in second place. B Beth, now you're in third place. Beth, now you're in fourth. How did you ever win the race? And Beth kind of looks at Chris and says, well, that's something we call 
drafting or working in a pace line. So here's Beth explaining to Chris Shankle on why World of Sports all about, you know, how the bicycling tactics work. And Chris was incredulous that she would just give up first place like that. And how did she win the race? But it was a great victory in France in 1980. And she's a very well-deserving world champion. So thank you much for Beth Hyden reed And now we'd like to welcome up our fourth 2013 class of the U.S. Bicycling Hall of Fame inductee. We got a video for him. He's been called the Renaissance Man of Cycling, Vince Menchie. In 1940, Vince Menci's Boy Scout troop stood at the finish line of the very first Tour of Somerville bicycle race. Hometown boy Furman Kugler won the 50-mile race, which was started by his father Fred, Pop Kugler. Vince's passion for cycling started that day, and soon Menci convinced his mom to purchase a $40 racing bike from Kugler's bicycle shop on the installment plan of $1 a week. Vince began training under Pop's guidance, and eventually he started racing. Mency raced competitively from 1942 to 1951 and won the New Jersey Men's Senior Division title in 1945. By 1947, Vince was a member of the Somerset Wheelmen and helping Pop Kugler raise sponsorships for the Tour of Somerville and learning how to produce cycling events. After being drafted in 1950 and serving in the Korean War, Mency eventually rejoined the Somerville cycling scene. He served as a New Jersey District Representative of the Amateur Bicycle League of America, now part of USA Cycling, and helped oversee races throughout the Garden State. Throughout the 1970s and 80s, Mency organized, coordinated, and promoted major cycling events that received national recognition and attracted competitors from throughout the world. These events included the Hills of Somerset County 80-mile road race and the Asbury Park Cycling Classic. One of his biggest contributions to the sport is the 125-mile University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey Bicycle Race of Health, which began in 1983 and is a three-day stage race that runs the entire length of the state. Vince was well known for driving throughout the state, looking for usable roads, and working with local mayors and police to support the race. In 1986, Vince was one of the founding members of the original U.S. Bicycling Hall of Fame in downtown Somerville and served as the curator of its collection until 2010. Mency helped establish uniform standards for race officials, organized officiating clinics and riding skills rodeos throughout the mid-Atlantic states, and has served as a chairman for both the Garden State Games cycling events and the New Jersey State Senior Games cycling competition. In over seven decades in the sport, he has been a race director and promoter, a cycling fitness and safety consultant, a trainer, a stock bike advocate, and a cycling historian. Vince Mency has worked tirelessly to ensure the overall advancement of the sport of cycling. As a longtime contributor to the sport, he has truly been one of cycling's greatest ambassadors. The former Boy Scout still lives near the finish line of the Tour of Somerville, where it all began. And now we'd like to welcome Vince Menchie. <clears throat> I hope I don't screw up. Um, I didn't come from a racing family. Um, and my, my experience with the cycling community was when uh, Pop Kugler ran the Tour Summer, the first, the first two, two years, and I was, I was a Boy Scout, I was holding the crowd back. After, after that happened, uh, I used to pass Pop Kugler's bike shop uh, on the way to school. And there was a bicycle there for $39.95. Uh, because I, I saw that bicycle in, in the window and I wanted my mom to buy it. 
So I got her down there, and she put a little down payment, and she paid a dollar a week after that. I used to go into Pop Cougar's store and sit down on the stool and listen to him tell me about the six-day races, about Frank Kramer, Alf Gillette, all those people. And, and I got the privilege of meeting Alf Gillette in New York City by uh, a fellow named uh, Black. Harvey Black was a, a very good official during the six-day races. So when I was in New York um, the, at the, one of the races that the New York clubs were putting on, I got the privilege of meeting uh, uh, Alf Gillette. He was 80-some years old. He lived to be 101. Uh, and but he, at, when I met him, he was so sharp, uh, and he really knew what cycling was all about. And I walked away very, very impressed by this man that was 80-some years old. I'm 86. And uh, that passion for cycling has been right there. I, ran, <clears throat> I was privileged to, to win one of the, to run one of the finest three-day stage races in New Jersey, and that was the, the uh, stage race of the uh, University of Medicine and Dentistry. And, uh, and, when I, and that was part of uh, Rutgers University. And when they first called me, because I was a district rep at the time, and they said, well, we want to run a, a race from, uh, high, from um, North Jersey to South Jersey. We want to call it the Bicycle Race for Health. I said, look, lady, if you don't have any money up front, don't bother me. <laughs> because I got so many calls from people uh, Mr. Mencia, I want to run a bicycle race, and I can get CBS and NBC. And I said, look, do you have $100,000? I said, well, then don't talk to me. <laughs> but these people, this woman, Audrey Koch, was in charge of the health department. And uh, one of her uh, employees went to London and saw the milk race in London, which is still run. And uh, when he, she came back, she talked to, to uh, Mrs. Koch, and Mrs. Koch was going to get, uh, she was going to serve a, a, for having 25 years with the, with the health department at, uh, at the university. And they, they gave her $25,000. So when they told me that 25000 was involved, I says, okay, I'll come down and see you. So I called Mike Frazee, who was then the vice president of the, he's one of the youngest vice president of the Amateur Bicycle League of America. And we went down to see the, the people. And after we got done talking to them, I, I, I walked out with Mike and I says, Mike, this is going to be a big one. We hit the jackpot. And he started laughing. So I went about and I organized three different stages. High Point which is the northernmost point of, uh, of New Jersey, to, to uh, Newark, and from Newark to Trenton, and from Trenton to Atlantic City. We did the race for five years, and it was very, very successful. The next big event was the, um, the event in Atlantic City put on by Mrs. Katrin Kramer. She was a little Jewish lady, but boy, she had that chutzpah. Jewish people have. And uh, she was involved with the Miss America pageant. So when she wanted to run a criterion race on the boardwalk and off the boardwalk, the parallel street and back on the boardwalk, I said, okay, we can do this. And uh, we had the best riders. She took Miss America, at that time, the, the previous winner of Miss America, she went to Europe. And, uh, and, and talk to all of the different uh, team managers at the, at the major races. And uh, then when she came back, we ran the race in September. And that was, after, that was before the World's Championship, and, and, I mean, after the World's Championship. And uh, it was very successful. The next race that she ran was the Mohawk Carpet Race. The Mohawk, Mo, Mohawk Carpet Company laid down the Mohawk 
rug on the boardwalk and, uh, put us, and they sold us uh, a finish line. And so the race was 50 miles and we went around it, uh, I guess about 40 sometimes. And, and then after the race was over, uh, I then was watching TV and all of a sudden uh, the, a commercial come on with Mohawk, Mohawk Carpet. And here they showed the bike riders riding across the Mohawk Carpet Race and saying, see, all these bike riders riding across the, uh, the, the carpet and it's still great. And it was a big commercial, it was great. I'd like to go back to when I started uh, racing. After Pop had, uh, had uh, when, I, when I went to, to see Pop about the bicycle, he let me have it after my mother paid about three quarters of it. And he said to me, Vince, don't ever, don't ever let anyone ride this bicycle. Well, this is your bike. It's a, it's a, it's, it's, when it rains, you gotta dry it off. You gotta keep it in good shape, but don't let anybody ride the bike. So, a few months later, uh, a month later, I was uh, at home and uh, there was a guy named Steve Demko who was a motorcycle nut. He would take motorcycles apart and put them back together again. And he said to me, Vince, I used to ride bicycles years ago. Let me, let me ride the bike around the block. I said, I don't, I don't think so, Steve. Uh, I don't know. Well, go ahead. Let me, let me do it. I said, all right. I said, just one one, block, one, one time around, okay, so he disappears down the street, makes the turn. Now I'm waiting. He's not coming around from the main street. All of a sudden, he comes around, he's carrying the bike. That's nice. I looked at, the, I looked at him, I said, oh my God, what happened? He said, I put my head down, fence, and I ran into a parked car. I pushed the front wheel right into the frame. Now I had to take the bike. Back to Pop Kugler. Well, when Pop saw me walk in, he said, what happened, Jimmy? That was my nickname that my mother gave me, even though my name is Vincent, but she had a brother that she loved, but she called me Jimmy. Anyway, <laughs> Pop says, takes the bike and puts it on a, on a, on a, on a different, on a, a stack of bikes that he had there. And he said, when I get time, I'll look, I'll, I'll look for it. Now I went out, I sat on the front, uh, uh, curb, and he was in the store, and I started crying because that bike meant everything to me. So he happened to come out, and he saw me on the curb, and he said, "Ah, oh, come on in here, kid." So I walked back in. He took the fork out, he straightened it out because he was a machinist by trade. He took he took the fork and fixed it up, put it back in the bike. He said. What did you learn? I said, never let anybody ride my bike again. I never did. I never let anybody touch my bike or ride my bike. <laughs> Pop Kugler. Sorry. You good? Yeah. Okay. Is, is it all right? Okay. I'm going to take some time, please. <laughs> anyway, uh, Pop called me one Christmas. And he said, uh, Jimmy, come on down to my house. We're, we're, we're going to have a little Christmas get together. Okay, so I went down there. And he said, here's your present. And he gives me a Drysdale that was made just for me. It was a white Drysdale with blue trim. Oh, my God. I said, Pop, this is, this is great. He said, come on, we'll go to the shop, put a couple of wheels on, throw a handlebars on it, and let you go out and ride. So I went out on my Christmas bike because of Pop Kugler, because he was like my second father. Like I said, my family wasn't, wasn't involved with cycling. My dad said, when you get to be 15, 16, get a job and you work. So he threatened to break my bike one time because I was riding after school. But somehow my mother stopped him. And then when I started winning some races or, or placing in the top three, and people where he worked would go up to him. Hey, Mr. Mencia, I hear your, you, you, your son had gotten second or third or what. 
Then my father says, well, it's not bad. He's She's pretty good. He's not, not a bad rider. So he never touched my bike. He never stopped me from going out and training, and that's what I did. Uh, over the years, over the years, my passion was uh, promoting big events. And, uh, then, and I got together, and, and, and when I worked with the uh, Hall of Fame as a volunteer, and when the whole thing first started, um, it was in a, a small building, and it was only a block and a half away from where I lived. And I used to go over there every day, and, uh, and I used to, to, to take all these material and jot it down and make a record of it. Most of the Hall of Fame material came from Pop Brennan, who had a bicycle shop in Irvington. Pop Brennan was also a famous mechanic for six-day races. So when the riders fell or they broke a wheel or what, he would repair it. All the top riders in the world came, when they came to New York to ride the six-day races, they all have went to Pop Brennan to make his, the wheels for them because he made them really strong and stiff because when he hit the bank, they would, they would still hold up. And, uh, and one time, after, after the war, they, uh, there was a six-day race they held at the 69th Street Armory in New York. And Pop said to me, uh, look, before the races start, they're going to have some amateur races. Vince, I want you to ride it. I, I said, Pop, I never rode on the bank track before. And he said, well, come on. This is the first time. Let's go. So I got on the, on, the, on the track. I tried it out a couple of times. And when I hit the, the bank, it was like the pressure behind my, my back pushing me through the, through the bank track. That, that's because it was so steep, and we just went around. Now the race started. Now, a lot of the guys in, the, in that race was Jackie Hyde and, 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 and a couple lot of kids from, from, from Buffalo where they had tracks. So when they came around, all of a sudden, they're slowing up on, on the bank. And I'm saying, oh my God, I'm in trouble. And then they went, they went. And so we went around, went around, and then all of a sudden, they came to the bank and they stopped. And there I am, I'm stopped, and all of a sudden, I slid down the bank. They went on. And so I didn't get in, in, in the race. So there was a, a, another race for all the people, all the riders that didn't place. And so when I got on, on in the race, Pop told me, he said, look, when they stay up front, if they slow up, keep on going, which I did. And I finally, uh, 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 one lap to go, I took off, and I never let anybody pass me, and I won the event. That was my uh, first time on a six-day track. It was great. <laughs> and I want to I acknowledge uh, a few more people here. Um, Rusty Stonemar, who was our president before the, before the, uh, the Hall of Fame moved here. And, uh, and I want to uh, recognize Peter DeHaan, uh, my special friend who came with me. Peter was my right-hand guy during the, all the times that I was a district rep and with the Hall of Fame. And he was always there for me. He was very generous. I want to recognize Peter DeHaan, and please acknowledge him. I got, one, I got one thing to say. When the, when the uh, Hall of Fame came to Davis, it broke my heart. And, uh, <laughs> it, 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 and, and but uh, after, after a while, and I came back the second time, I mean the first time, I saw this beautiful building, and I said to myself, you know what, it's in a good place. And, uh, now I come back and I see that you guys are, have done a wonderful job, and so I'm happy that's in Davis, and I think Davis is a wonderful time, a town, and it's a really cycling town, and I'm proud to be associated uh, with the Hall of Fame here in Davis. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Vince Benchy. Thank you, Vince.
All right. So a couple more administrative items. We will have those silent auction items that did not receive a bid. You can now put a minimum bid and receive those items. If you did buy a silent auction item, make sure you pay for it on your way out. If you bought a live auction item, do that as well. Uh, we've had a wonderful evening here tonight. I want to thank all the attendees. Thank you very much for coming to being part of our 2013 U.S. Bicycling Hall of Fame induction evening. We want to thank our four inductees. Where's Doris? Doris, raise your hand one more time. Doris Trevani Mulligan. Mike King, Mike King. Beth Hyden Reed. And Vince Menchie. They're going to come up here and take some pictures. If you've got some more stories you want to hear from them or you want to get some autographs, you can do that as well. I think this spot does it. And again, we'll see you next year when we induct the class of 2014. So thanks again, and we'll see you next year.